So we're going to talk about some more rhetorical devices. These are psychological and related fallacies. What's a fallacy again? We talked about this. Conclusion the wrong way. It doesn't mean your conclusion's wrong, it just means you came about it the wrong way. You use something that does not comport with critical thinking. So these are some fallacies and rhetorical devices. First one let's talk about is argument from outrage or the, the uh, rhetorical device of outrage. But actually, before we do, here's something that's interesting. I was just looking at this. The authors in this version of the book, which is the seventh edition, they start off by saying, they write this at the very beginning. Does anybody have the seventh edition on them? No. You do? OK, read it to me as I, Mr. Savage. This was in the book, 7th edition. The authors start off and they say, talking about Mr. Savage. And they tell you, the reader, the student that they wrote the book for, knowing that you're college students, and they share this with you about Mr. Savage. Who knows who Mr. Savage is? Anybody heard of Mr. Savage? Anybody listen to Mr. Savage's show? Does anybody have an opinion about Mr. Savage? At this point, do you have an opinion about Mr. Savage? Savage. If you were listening to the radio and somebody said, uh, next we have Mr. Savage, what would you think to yourself? Would you think, yay, I want to hear what this guy has to say? Would you think, oh, I don't want to hear what this guy has to say. I bet you he's a jerk. Or what, what would you think about him? What do you think after seeing this? I would probably want to hear him. He's going to tell you the truth, right? Okay. Would be glad. Anybody else? Everybody agree? Everyone has a positive belief, positive view of him after, after this? An annoying spokesman? Yeah. All right. Most people would think negatively after having negative things said about him. Wouldn't you think he spews hate? Yes. Wouldn't you think he was vociferously angry? Yes. Would you know he was a talk radio host? Yes. That's what you were told by this, right? You didn't know any of those things. This led you, or led you to believe, based on what the authors had to say, that there's a guy out there named Mr. Savage. He's a talk radio host. He's loud and obnoxious. He's mean. He's angry. And he's filled with hate. Probably, right? Because you don't know who he is. Why would you think anything different? But nobody here has heard of Michael Savage, right? I've listened to his show a bunch of times. I've probably listened to his show maybe 50 to 100 times over the years. He's been on the air for about 25 years. And he's really not that bad in comparison. In comparison, I mean, if you're comparing him to, you know, some nut or something, then 
you might think he's bad, but if you're comparing him to other talk radio hosts, he's not as bad by any stretch of the imagination. He's not one of the worst, and he's definitely not one of the most vociferously angry of all the hosts. Mark Levin takes that cake. But now that we went through the last chapter and the authors in the book explained all of these rhetorical devices that you need to be aware of and explained to you that rhetorical devices are, are typically fallacies and that their intent is to manipulate you and to try to sway you to think a certain way and to believe a certain thing. And then the very next chapter they start off with this sentence and what do you notice as great students who have prepared for the class, read and did your studying? What do you see up here? Proof surrogate. Where's the proof surrogate? Uh, his, opponents his opponents. Who are these people? News media loves to do this. They will say things that they want to say and reference some vague opponent. Opponents to Trump say that, and then they can just say whatever they want by just putting this vague opponents. Opponents to Obama say, and they can say whatever they want without citing who it is. Proof surrogates are powerful. What else? Weasler, where? Is he the most specifically angry? I just challenged that, right? And so what are they going to say, the authors? Well, we said perhaps. You see how they weaseled out? What else? What is this? Huh? What, what did what but what about it? But which rhetorical device do you think it is? And by the way, you wanted an example of a rhetorical definition. Guess what we have here? Very what is he? We're defining him as the most vociferously angry of all the talk radio hosts and a hate and a, and a hate radio guy. He's defined as that here. See how that's a rhetorical definition of him? We also have a thing called po poisoning the well. we haven't talked about it yet, but this is an example of poisoning the well. Poisoning the well is when you say something bad about somebody in advance, encouraging someone not to listen to them or take them seriously. And you clearly see that's what they're doing here, right? They're poisoning the well. So if you ever in the future had an opportunity to hear Michael Savage, you would go, no thanks, I've had my fill of hate radio, been vociferously angry talk radio hosts, up to here with these guys, right? So what else do we have other than our proof surrogate, our rhetorical definition, our weasler, our poison of the well? What else do we have? <clears throat> Is he the most vociferously angry? Or is that a bit hyperbolic? Sounds hyperbolic to me. What? Hyperbolic. Doesn't it sound hyperbolic? Yeah. yeah. That's hyperbole, isn't it? <clears throat> you know what else is hyperbole? Hate radio. You know what else hate radio is, as well as being hyperbole? 
Is it talk radio? No, he doesn't do talk radio. He does hate radio. You're presenting talk radio in a way that's negative, right? A dysphemism. So hate radio can be seen as a dysphemism as well as a bit hyperbolic. All right. I just thought it was interesting that the authors who just got done explaining to us that as critical thinkers, you need to be careful of using rhetorical devices and being able to see through rhetorical devices, the very next chapter load the very beginning of their chapter up with a whole bunch of rhetorical devices. We all do it, right? The point is not that we should rid the world of rhetorical devices. The point is that we see through them when they're there. And we know when we're being manipulated. All right. So when you guys, everything, every time you guys read anything from now on, I want you to read it this way in your life. Whenever you hear something, you hear it this way. You automatically look for how you're trying to be, how someone's trying to manipulate you. And see through it. Pen and a good eraser. That's nice. Just go that. All right, where were we? Outrage. Outrage is a rhetorical device and a fallacy. Outrage consists of inflammatory words followed by a conclusion. Outrage typically are inflammatory words followed by either a conclusion or a call to action, typically. Inflammatory words followed by a conclusion or a call to action. What are inflammatory words? Words that are on fire. No. Use words to make something seem worse than it is, or just to exaggerate it. Okay. Yeah. They're intending to inflame, to get people to react, to get them mad. Inflammatory words are intended to get someone mad. And they substitute, outrage substitutes anger for reason. The point of outrage is to get you to stop thinking and stop using reason and instead use anger and be motivated by anger. They use inflammatory words, get you to stop thinking straight, and want you to react. Did you hear what Trump said about brown people? You should be mad as hell about this and go out and mark. You see how that's inflammatory words followed by a call to action. You see how it replaces reason for outrage and anger. They want you to think, just react. Little kids do this on the on the playground, by the way. They'll say something like, did you hear what Steve said about your mom? You're not going to let him get away with that, are you? Hell no. My book's falling apart. Questions? Move on. Next one. Scapegoating. Want 
this one work? Scapegoating. Scapegoating is when you try to blame a person or a group of people for all the problems. Scapegoating is when you try to blame a person or a group of people for all the problems. When they don't deserve it. And they rarely do. Scapegoating is when you try to heap all the blame onto one person or a group of people when they don't deserve it. So isn't that me or is it? It could be. Yeah, I think. I think a lot of times that does fall into that category. Not necessarily. Um, you could say, for example, that all of the economic problems that we have today are because of Obama. It's not racist to say that. Didn't like his politics. He thought he did bad policies. Uh, all the problems we have are because of the Democrats. It's not racist. But clearly, if you said all the problems of Germany are the Jews, well, see, Jews are an interesting category. Is that a race or is it a religion? religion. It's a religion, but it's a religion that has intermarried so much that it's almost synonymous with, you know, a race. Not quite, but almost. So, um, but, yeah. <clears throat> So if you were to, like, let's say all the problems were because of black people, all the problems because of white people. And you notice the Democratic Party right now is kind of doing that right now. Everybody that stands up and is running for president, they're all blaming all the problems on who? Listen to them. White men. It's all white men's problem. Those are the ones that have caused all the problems in America. Yeah? M &M. Yeah, so anytime you blame a, a person or a group of people, that's what you're doing, is you're scapegoating. It's dangerous, but it's natural. It's something that we as human beings have to fight to overcome. We've talked about this before in the class, the idea of us and them. That's a powerful concept. Us, we trust. Them we don't. Them are dangerous. Them are people that can come in and take our money and our women and our houses and our whatever stuff we are trying to protect and keep safe. And I don't know what their intents are, what their intentions are. And so it's scary. And them can be whatever you define as them. Someone from a different race, a different country, different religion different state. It's so absurd that when you go down into some neighborhoods, it's somebody from a different street. Oh, those are the guys from 13th Street. Let's go get them. What? Okay. It's still them, right? Someone wears the wrong color. It's them. We don't trust them. And it's something that when you look back at in time, it's it's been used very powerfully. Uh, for example, the Black Plague. Remember when the Black Plague? You guys studied that in school? What were you taught it was caused by? Yeah, yeah, that's what they think, that, that it was fleas on rats that, that caused it. I don't know how they know that now, but it's interesting that they they taught me that, and they teach you guys that too, maybe. Um, but who was blamed? The rats weren't blamed. Remember in history class? The gypsies were blamed. You know why the gypsies were blamed? It's obvious, they were them. Gypsies were weird. They were different. They kept it themselves. They lived away from the city. And so the people in the city saw those weird gypsies out there. And they're weird because they're not us. 
and they were blamed. And the gypsies were attacked and killed. So admit that's different from us. We're afraid of it. So as critical thinkers, you need to realize that and try to continually overcome the natural inclination to be afraid and fear and hate and blame others just because they're different, just because they're them. All right. Next one. Let's talk about some scare tactics. Scare tactics. <clears throat> A scare tactic is when you try to scare somebody into taking a position. Oh, by the way, I just remember, you can interdelineate this in your notes on the scapegoating. What is what do you think it substitutes for reason? Hate. Hate? Uh, I don't I don't think it's hate. Fear. Yeah. What is it? Fear. Fear. It's fear, but but sometimes that fear we, we lash out physically, and so people assume that that is hate. But I but. Hate, and, and when you think about it, hate has a much more uh, familiar issue. You have to be really familiar with somebody to hate them. You know what I mean? You can't just like not know somebody and, and hate them. That's, that's fear. That's anxiety. That's paranoia. So this substitutes fear, anxiety, and paranoia for reasoning. You have to know somebody well to hate them. That's why one of the, it bothers me when, when people use the word hate all the time for fear and paranoia. You may fear somebody, you may fear groups of people, you may be paranoid about them, but it doesn't rise to the level of hate. You hate your ex-spouse sometimes. Probably a bad idea to do so, but you see what I'm saying? That's the difference. You know them well enough. It takes intimacy to hate. So I forgot to mention that. It substitutes fear, paranoia, and anxiety for reason. Okay, scare tactics. Scare tactics are when you try to use fear to get somebody to change their position. It's fear of something happening in the future. You scare people into taking a position. So obviously it, it too substitutes fear for reasoning. And it's the idea where you say, if you if we don't pass a new green deal, then we will have 12 years before the world starts falling apart and the world will end as we know it. You see how that's a scare tactic? Why would you vote for the new green deal? out of fear that the world is going to end. If you re-elect President Trump, he's going to put a whole bunch of judges on the bench that are very conservative, and then you won't be able to have your abortions. Whatever. You won't be able to, I don't know, whatever. Whatever law you're talking to with the group that you think is important to them, right? That's, that's a scare tactic. Saying in the future something bad's going to happen if you don't take a position, if you don't act now. A type of scare tactic. So under the umbrella of scare tactics is a very specific type of scare tactic, and it's its own separate rhetorical device or fallacy. And that is the scare tactic of force. So you have scare tactics in general. One of those is when you use force to manipulate. Force is when you have a scare tactic that has immediacy. You threaten somebody with some physical or otherwise bad occurrence that's going to happen immediately. 
and you see that I'll, I'll, I'll show you the difference because they're very similar. One says, if this doesn't happen, you know, if you don't, if you re-elect Trump, then X, this could happen and this could happen and the world could be a bad place. As opposed to, sit down or I'm going to smash you in the head with a baseball bat. You see the immediacy of it? One is a scare tactic, the other is force. I'm forcing you to do this. If you don't show up at 8 a.m. tomorrow, you're fired. You see the difference? That's immediate. That's an argument that's using, or a, position, a rhetorical device that's using force instead of just some esoteric, in the future, bad thing that could happen. So let me mix two for you. That is a historic situation. Back before we had integrated schools in the South, in some parts, there were schools where you had the black schools and the white schools. <clears throat> and then at some point, people said, well, what are we doing here? This is ridiculous. We should just have schools. And some people didn't like that idea. And the argument against integrating the schools, one of the arguments was, well, you know, if you integrate the schools, then you have to be very careful about your white daughters. What is that? It's a scare tactic, not force. See, that's more of a vague, veiled fear of the evil black man, the hypersexual black man, uh, a sexual stereotype of a black man, coupled with what? The stereotype. The stereotype with the fear, right? And so you have a stereotype and a scare tactic combined in that to create that argument there that people would use. Both rhetorical devices, both attempting to manipulate and persuade, both not using any reason or critical thinking. All right. Questions? Next one. <clears throat> Let's talk about pity. The rhetorical device of pity. Pity is when you try to uh, create sorrow or, or feelings of uh, um, sympathy and compassion to try to manipulate somebody. It's when we allow, pity is when we allow those feelings to change our opinion, make us act instead of reasoning. And it's natural that we have empathy. It's natural that we have sympathy. But when you allow those to cloud your judgment and your reasoning, then you're allowing the fallacy or the rhetorical device of pity. take hold. So, pity a lot, uh, substitutes empathy, sympathy, and compassion for reasoning. It substitutes empathy, sympathy, and compassion for reasoning. What? Empathy, sympathy, and compassion. It substitutes those for reasoning. It wants you to take a position or act based on your empathy or your sympathy or your compassion. And those are natural things that we have for other human beings. One time I was driving down the road, I saw a bumper sticker. And it said, I vote Democrat because I love children. It's, it's all about the kids. Anytime somebody takes a position like that and says, well, it's about the homeless people. It's about the children. It's about the old people. And they use those types of, it's about the sick people. And they want to whoop up some story about, well, let me tell you about a story about this, this person who, and they give you this sob story, and they go, now, as a result of that, you should take a vote or change your position. No, we don't, we don't do that. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Don't you want to just throw something at the TV? Those 
Yeah. What is it? USPC. SPCA. US SPCA, whatever it is. And that's a perfect example of that. Is they have the little pictures with the music crescendoing and the tears rolling down the dog's face, and then they have the little superimposed. I just wanted to love you, but you kicked me in the head or something like that. And you're like, oh my gosh. And you, you're reaching for your wallet. You're dialing the phone quickly because you want to give your money. Here, just take it all. Stop the commercial already. We've all seen it, right? Does, does everybody immediately turn the channel? Because you just can't handle it. it. It hurts my stomach to watch those things. I can't even handle it. I think, dude, you're doing yourself a disservice to put that commercial on there. People just run from it. It's so heartbreaking. But yeah, that's a great example of, of that. So <clears throat> politicians a lot of times will stand up, and, and this happened with the, with the Obamacare. President Obama said, we're going to have to pass the Affordable Care Act. And before I go into my speech, I just want to introduce you to Cindy. Cindy, come out here, talk to the crowd. And Cindy comes. <clears throat> She hobbles up with her little walker, <laughs> and she gets up to the thing, and she says, Hi, everyone. I just want to let you know that because of the evil, evil Republicans and the evil, evil insurance companies, I almost died. And if we don't pass this, and she tells some sob story, and everyone's in tears, and oh, my gosh, and then she hobbles away, and then he now gives a speech after he softened everyone up with pity. Do, is it natural to have pity? Absolutely. Do you make a decision based on pity? No. You make a decision based on what's the best scenario for most people. Because what happens when you pass Obamacare? Did we talk about this? You screw people. What happens if you don't pass Obamacare? You screw people. Yeah. When Obamacare passed, people lost their insurance. People also got insurance that didn't have it. People's insurance went up. People, right? I mean, you're going to have that much complexity. You're going to have problems. So now what is Trump doing? Trying to get rid of Obamacare. What is he going to do? He's going to parade Sally across. And she's going to hobble up. And she's going to say, because of Obamacare, I now have lost. And then, no, you don't make decisions based on those things. That's not why you make decisions. And so pity is a... Is a is, an annoying one that, as you can tell, bugs me. That, but they, they they'll do it with the homeless, the children, the poor, etc. All right. Questions about that? Next one. Envy. Envy. <clears throat> e N V Y. Envy is when we find fault. In somebody or something or a position because we long to be like them. We find fault in somebody because we envy them. We long to be like them. We want what they have. And you can see how all of these are based in kind of common natural human traits, human in in inclinations. You find fault in somebody because they have what you want. You want to be like them. Why? Doesn't that sound weird? But again, it's like that same thing of us versus them. That's weird too. But these are natural things that have been ingrained through survival necessity. Think about this. You're in junior high. You're a female. You're sitting eating lunch with your friends. You got three or four friends around you, and you look over and you see the cheerleading squad walk by in their little cheerleading outfits. And you all watch them walk by, and they get done walking by, and then you do what? 
you say something. Yeah. Oh, stupid bitches. <laughs> Whatever. Why do white or the other way around? The football team goes walks by and strapping lads, good looking young men, football popular kids, and then the other guys watch them go by and they go, oh, this son of a bitch thinks he's all cool and they just well, why do we do that? Why do we talk negatively about people who have the things that we want? Guy drives by in a nice Porsche, son of a bitch with his nice man. We, we hate these people, or we think we do, we dislike them. Why do we have animosity to, toward people who have what we want? It's weird, isn't it? We don't know them. And in fact, we want to have what they have. We want to tax the rich, why? Because they're sons of bitches. But at the same time, we're all sitting here in class because we want to be one of them. And it's the same idea, if you think back since the beginning, there's limited resources out there. And there always kind of have been until America came along. We don't know what this is like. This is a weird thing. We all live like kings and queens. Literally, our poor live like the kings and queens of the old days. We have more food than we know what to do with. The poorest of the poorest of the poor in our country are fat. They've got food that they just throw away. They're sitting there with their, with their air conditioning and their cell phones and their carpet and, and glass windows and their own homes and servants that do their nails and their hair and their toes. That's how our poor live. So we don't understand what it's like to have limited resources, but the rest of humanity from the beginning of time until now, there was limited resources. If somebody had something that meant that you might not have it. If there's one fish out there, you might have to grapple to get that fish. That was kind of a reality. And so when you saw somebody that had something that you wanted or needed, there was a natural inclination to rise up and to take it. Right? And so we have to, rational people, civilized people, realize this and overcome it. Civilized people realize that the pity gets in the way they overcome it. Civilized people realize that envy and all of those things that we've been talking about, the us versus them, we overcome those things because we're civilized and we use reason and we use rationality and critical thinking and decision making. So don't hate the rich because they're rich and don't take a policy and a position because a rich person is going to benefit from it, you know? Or poor, whatever it is. Someone with a Porsche or someone with a big house. All right, questions about that one? It substitutes jealousy for reasoning. Envy substitutes jealousy for reasoning. Do you think most of the time why we're jealous is because we're lazy? That's a good. That's a good observation. Yeah, yeah. There's there's two things, and we talked about this a little bit before. That that why communism fails. It's tried over and over and over and over again because it's a beautiful idea, right? We talked about it. It's it's a, it's, a, it's a really great idea. Listen to o, Ocasio. What's her? What's that chick's name? Ocasio. Ocasio Cortez. Cortez. I can never get it right. Ocasio-Cortez, she's basically spouting the same ideas. These are beautiful ideas. Why, why do we all have to be different? Why, can't, why do there have to be rich and poor? Can't we all just have the same amounts? It's evil and wrong for there to be differences in income. And you go, yeah. But what has failed over and over and over again is exactly what you just said, or the reason why it's failed. It's because we all sit there, we all in a group, we all say, do we all agree? Yeah, we're all going to work hard, right? Yeah, no one's going to be lazy, right? Yeah, we're not going to be greedy, right? No, no, we all agree. Put your hand in. Ready? Go! And you turn around, and you get home, and the five minutes that it takes to walk home, you go, I don't know, maybe I'll watch a little TV, and then uh, you can have some ice cream, and then... And then maybe, you know, maybe I'll binge a little bit more TV. And oh shoot, it's 1 a.m. I can't believe it's so late. One more show, just one more show. 
I have no self-control. And now it's two, damn it, okay, I'm gonna go to bed. Okay, then I'm gonna get up early and go to work. And what happens at, when the alarm goes off at six? <laughs> That's human nature. You swore in your children's eyes that you were going to contribute and work hard just like everyone else. And then human nature gets in the way. We are naturally lazy. We are naturally greedy. We are naturally inclined to take more. You, you, you have a buffet. What do people do? That's ah, crap. They go, what? I mean, it, it, it's kind of a natural thing that we do that. Why? Why don't we just take what we need and... Go back for seconds. Eh. And until we fix human nature, there has to be consequences to, to curb behavior to some degree. Don't you realize that if you work for yourself, it's tougher than if you have a boss who tells you you have to be here? Right? Consequences. We, we, some people are damn good employees. In fact, I was talking to, this is a tangent, so thanks for the tangent. I was talking to, uh, talking to a client of mine. And we have a, a mutual friend right now who's in prison. And um, we were saying that, that he does great in prison. Everybody loves him in prison. All the guards love him, and he's a model inmate, and he, gets, he works hard, and he, he runs three or four miles a day, and he does several hundred push-ups a day, and, and he's just the greatest guy in the world while he's in prison. And then he gets out and he gets some freedom and he runs amok. And he has all the great intentions. I talked to him when he's in prison. Man, when I get out, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, i got a job waiting for me. And then he's been to prison three or four times and he says the same thing every time. He has great intentions. We probably all know somebody who's an addict of some sort. And you talk to them and they go, Okay, this is the last time. They have great intentions. And then they fall short. And he gets out, he falls short. So, and we all have a different level of necessity of some sort of control. Some people need, some people can be entrepreneurs and they have their own job and they get up and they get up early and they bust their ass and they work hard and they're dedicated. And you can give them all the freedom in the world, they don't abuse it. Other people, eh, they should probably work for somebody else. And if they're working for someone else, they're great employees. And other people, even more so, need to be regulated. And other people, they do well in prison. And so we have different levels of, of need for control over our behavior, it, it seems like. It is, it's kind of weird, but we, we were talking about that observation that we had. But everybody, to some degree, needs some sort of accountability. That's why men do better in marriage. Men are way more inclined to run amok. And women provide us that stability, typically. Typically. You know, or a spouse in general. Whether it's you know, men and women, it's just, if you have a spouse, there's accountability. If you have a partner, there's accountability. There's somebody when you get home that says, you know, where have you been? What's going on? How come, uh, I've got to answer to somebody. I don't know, it's just interesting. But yeah, that's a great reason. Okay, next one. Let's talk about apple polishing. Apple polishing, when you polish an apple. You guys know what apple polishing is? You ever heard of it before? You can see the gesture when you put it on Apple and you go. What do you do if you want to kiss up to your teacher? Bring him an apple. Bring him an apple. Right? And why? You're trying to earn favor. Earn favor by doing something nice. You're buying somebody's affections or favorable treatment or rounding off in the right direction on the grades. Apple polishing is, is, the, same, is the same thing. 
Apple polishing is when we use um, flattery instead of reasoning. and pride instead of reasoning. So it's flattery on one side and pride on the other. If you are the victim of apple polishing, somebody says positive things about you, gives you compliments, and then your pride allows you to succumb to these favorable statements. And the flattery is used to try to manipulate you, to manipulate your pride. We all think that we are better than we really are. <coughs> we all think we're smarter and cooler and funner. And, and so when somebody says those things, we go, oh, finally, somebody sees me the way I ought to be seen. I like this person. I'm going to keep him around. The whole yes man sort of thing, right? There's power in that. So when someone will say something like, well, the American people are smart enough to know that Donald Trump has destroyed our country. You see how that's apple polishing? Because you hear that and you go, yeah, I'm smart. He knows I'm smart. I'm totally smart, and he knew it, so I agree with him. It's subtle, right? But who's going to say, oh, no, no, I'm not smart enough to know that? Nobody, right? Or would you? I don't know. I saw that as more as convincing someone to agree with you, because if they don't, then, then, then they aren't smart, you know? Well, yeah. The other, the other extreme of that. Yeah. Either way. It works either way. Yeah. <clears throat> um, let me see. Let's see if there's any in the book here. Um, how about how about this one? Uh, uh, attorneys do this sometimes. They'll say something like, uh, this, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you are very astute, and I know you've paid close attention to the evidence, and you, you're, you're rational, and you're going to weigh this out, and you say all those positive things, and they go, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's why when you look at the evidence, you will see those are all positive things that attorneys do. Those are apple polishing. Or a police officer comes over at your window, doesn't give you a ticket, and you go, Oh hi! I really like your, your, the way your uniform fits. I've always loved a man in a uniform. You look really good tonight. Your breath is very fresh, by the way, as you're leaning in, and your smile, white teeth. Wow! Did you have braces? No? Shocking. Just the normal chiseled good looks, I guess. Oh, oh, it's a warning. Well, thank you. <laughs> Brown nosing, yeah. Right? They might still give you a ticket though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But another thing that is useful for that, and it works for see, women get away with these things more than men typically, because officers are typically more likely to be men still. But uh, <laughs> the pity as well, right? Women use that all the time. Officer shows up to the window, rolls it down. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have the money, and my dad's going to be mad, and my boyfriend is mad, whatever. Oh, it's okay. It's, oh, no, 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 it's okay. Have a good night. Pity. Right? Guy tries that. <laughs> Knock it off. <laughs> have contempt for him. It's unfair. But that's okay. Life's not fair. All right, Apple Polishing. Is that, that a good example? A couple of them for you? <clears throat> Next one, guilt trip. <clears throat> okay. 
Guilt trip is when we try to elicit feelings of guilt or have somebody take a position. Um, guilt trip is when you use, you try to get somebody to uh, feel obligated. The idea is to try to get somebody to feel obligated. And when you get somebody to feel obligated, you're using guilt trip. When you try to get somebody to feel obligated, I and mean, if you succeed in that, then you're using guilt trip. So it does. It, sub it substitutes feelings of obligation for reason. It substitutes obligation for reason, or the belief that you're obligated to do something. A quid pro quo. You guys know what quid pro quo is? Tit for tat, this for that. I'll give you something if you give me something. Quid pro quo. You get somebody to believe that they owe you. They're obligated. I'll scratch your back and scratch my back. Yeah. And once you scratch their back, then you show up and you say, hey, I want you to do this. And they go, no, I don't think I should do that. But I scratched your back. Parents are great at guilt trip. It's 10 o'clock. You're at a party. I want to go to sleep. You what? My parents always say, I want to go to sleep. Yeah. <laughs> parents say, I want to go to sleep. I want to. But your parents, your parents call you up and they say, All right, is that party almost done? And you go, well, Steve just showed up and I haven't seen him in a long time and I want to talk to him and then I'll leave. And they say, well, how long? I don't know. Can I be home at 11? 11 o'clock, is that okay? And your parents go, no, 10.30. No, no, I want to be home at 11. You're arguing back and forth and your parents go, your mom says, fine, but after nine months of carrying you in my belly, you don't even care enough about me to have my feelings considered, and you just stay out as long as you want, and you go, fine, fine, mom, I'll be home at 10.30 instead of 11. As if carrying you nine months in your belly has anything to do with you staying out at 10 o'clock at night, 15 to 18 years later, right? Feelings of obligation. And they're typically totally unrelated like that. Yeah. Or like, you have to take care of your parents when they're old. <laughs> Well, that is, yes. <laughs> Guilt trip, your parents go, why don't you take care of me? I wiped your butt for, now you wipe mine. So, yeah, but that's a little more connected, though, because they actually did take care of you for most of your life and probably most of your adult life, as I'm realizing as my kids are adults. You know, it used to be that kids would grow up and become adults and move out of the home and contribute to society. Now they just sit around and suckle at the tea to their parents for the rest of their friggin' lives. That's your kids. Yeah. <laughs> no, my kids actually aren't, but I see it a lot. They aren't yet. They may come back. <laughs> All right. Next one is wishful thinking. <coughs> wishful thinking happens when we accept or we urge acceptance of a claim because it would be pleasant if it were true. Wouldn't it be nice if this claim were true? So then it probably is. It's when you urge acceptance of a claim, or you accept a claim, because it would be nice if it were true. It would be pleasant. We can't achieve perfect equality. Right? It would be pleasant if that were true. Your kids will go to bed on time. Kids will go to bed on time. Wouldn't that be nice if that were true? Oh, yeah. Is there a God? Well, one of the
the arguments for the existence of God is the fallacy of wishful thinking. It sure would be nice if it were true that there's an old grandfather-like figure who loves us and cares about us. Wouldn't that be nice? Absolutely. Is that why there is a God? No. No. There's other there's better reasons and arguments for the argument for the proof God proofs. Um, but wishful thinking is often used as as the fallacy that people use. Well it would be nice if there were God, so there must be. Next one, peer pressure. Oh, by the way, with wishful thinking, it substitutes hope for reason. Wishful thinking substitutes hope for reason. I just thought of another one, by the way, on the wishful thinking. Free college. <laughs> That's a wishful thinking. Wouldn't it be nice if there was free college? Wouldn't it be nice if there was free fill in the blank? Is anything in life free? And by the way, in all in all the candor, you don't want it to be. The quickest way to ruin yourself and somebody else is give them something for free. That'll destroy them quicker than anything. People need to work for their stuff. You need to work for your stuff. I need to work for my stuff. I realize in life the stuff that came too easy, I don't appreciate. The stuff you work for, you appreciate. Remember the, remember the buffet? You don't appreciate it. You pile it up and you waste it. Think about it. If college were free, you didn't have to pay for it. How hard would you study? Fill all their classes up, like the buffet. Show up now and then. Ah, who cares? I'll just take it again, like next time. No big deal. I'll just, right? There would be a contempt for it. Okay. Where were we? Wishful thinking, right? Peer no. Pressure. Peer pressure. Peer pressure. Desire for acceptance. <clears throat> motivates us to accept a claim sometimes. A desire for acceptance motivates us to accept claims sometimes. You know, I've seen these things before uh, in different books and, and there was studies that have been done that um, I've seen kind of duplicated in my, my own experiences in life where a teacher will ask a question and the study, the study that I, I saw was so they'll have they'll have that and they'll say, how many people think this line is longer than this line? And you know, students will raise their hand, and people look around because they go, they want to make sure, because they go, it's just a trick? Because they don't look alike, and it looks like that one's maybe shorter, but I don't know, is this, is this a trick? And then the person will say, well, they're actually the same length. By the way, they're the same length. It's kind of cool, right? And then the teacher will do something like this, and they'll go, oh, and then there's this one. And they'll say, are these the same? How many people say those are the same? And then the students will raise their hand. And everyone raises their hand, and the study is to spell out, there's one person in the class who doesn't know that this is a fake class. Everyone raises their hand, and the person's, Everyone's proudly raising their hand, they're the same length, and they go. 
even though they know it's not. In your life, you've probably done that before, right? You've gone, oh crap, uh, yeah, okay, and you've agreed with something that you know is wrong, or you think it is, and you go, well, maybe, maybe I'm missing something. They, they must all know. And it's that idea that my friends all know something I don't know. What am I missing, right? By the way, what's the lengths on these? Bottom one is quite a bit longer, right? So, um, the idea that peer pressure gets us to take positions, adopt claims, because all of our friends, all of our peers are doing it. It's a powerful thing. Even as adults. More powerful as kids. Kids have a harder time dealing with peer pressure than adults. They're a little more unsure of who they are, and they're trying to figure out who they are. And so they try different things on it sometimes. Well, maybe I'm a hard rocking sort of guy. Okay, no, I'm not that. Maybe I'm more of a lover. Nah, maybe I'm a fighter. Well, maybe I'm studious. And you know, you try on different different hats until you find something that fits you and you like and you're comfortable with. But during that time of insecurity, you're very prone to do what your friends do. I would always tell my, my kids, the most important decision you make in your life is choosing your friends because you will do what your friends do. It's not a matter of you may, it's you will do what your friends do. If you choose friends that are smoking, guess what? You're going to smoke. If you choose friends that wear Vans off the wall shoes, you're going to be coming over to me and saying, Dad, I need to buy some Vans off the wall shoes. By the way, I used to love Vans when I was a kid. There was a Vans store right down the way. It was Fairly new, actually. Brand new company down in SoCal. And I remember putting them on, walking out the door, and running down the street as fast as I could, down the sidewalk, and running back and going, yeah, <laughs> those are good shoes. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, door. <laughs> Let me tell you a story about peer pressure. I was in second grade, and uh, I was very uh, insecure as a child. And <clears throat> I walked around the corner, and there was these kids who, in my estimation, were cool kids. And they were taking those little bark chunks. You know, sometimes I use them in. And like under bushes, they take little chunks of bark and they throw it underneath there, and it's ground covering. And they were taking these little bark chunks, and they were throwing them uh, at the bell on, on the wall. You know, so when the bell would ring, that's the bell that would ring. They were throwing them, trying to hit the bell, and they'd ding! Every once in a while, somebody hit it, ding! And I thought, that looks like fun. Throwing bark at a bell? Dude. Four or five hours later, you could come back and those boys would still be doing it. Ah. Boys are very simple-minded. So I grab the bark and I start throwing it, <laughs> laughing, yay, ding, not realizing, ding, that sound travels, ding, and teachers are going, what the hell is going on? And so a teacher walks around the corner and sees all of us boys standing there throwing these little chunks of wood at the bell. And the teacher says, oh, you come over here. Scatter. No, this is, this, is, this is before scatter. This is back in the days when we obeyed. Yes, ma'am. And so we all slunked over to her, and she said, go to the principal's office. You're all in trouble for throwing, throwing rocks at school. So we all went over to the principal's office. And uh, the principal pulled me in the office. He said, what is your name? And I told him. And he goes, oh, Dale Clevin? Yeah, Clevin. Don and Shirley Clevin is your, are your parents? I said, yeah, yeah. And named several of my other relatives. Well, my family was a very 
large, well-known family. My parents were business owners and were fairly well-known. And so he said, I know your family. I know your parents. You come from a good family. You wouldn't be doing this, would you? Well, guess what I said? No, of course not. <laughs> I come from a very good family. I wouldn't be doing something like this. I didn't think so. How did you get caught up in this? I don't know. I must have been walking by or something. I don't know. Well, <clears throat> I'm sorry you got caught up in this. You run along. You're a good kid. And I walked out, walked by the other kids as they watched me go by. Dude. <laughs> no paddling, no crying, and I walked off to my freedom and let them suffer the consequences of honesty. And the fact that I remember that today, what does that tell you? <laughs> you only remember the things that impact you. That was powerful to me in my life. I regretted that my whole life. The opportunity to stand up and to take the consequences and to be honest, even though honesty was, in my estimation at the time, a painful thing. In reality, who gives a crap, right? The lesson was be honest. But instead, I used my family's good name to get out of responsibility. Wow, what a horrible thing. And I have regretted that every day since that I've thought of it. And, and, but it was peer, because of peer pressure. I wanted to fit in more than I wanted to do the right thing. I knew what the right thing was, and it didn't matter. The desire to belong is extremely powerful. It substitutes acceptance for reasoning. You will think what your friends think, you will do what your friends do, and when it comes to taking positions on claims, you will take the position of your friends because you want to fit in, you want to be accepted. Critical thinkers don't do that. Critical thinkers stand up and say, nah, you're all crazy, and here's why. And the irony is the person who stands up and challenges their friends is the one that they all respect and that's the one who's the leader. But Again, human nature is that we all want to be followers. It's tough to be a leader. 99.9% .9 of us are followers. It's the rare individual that stands up and leads. It's uncomfortable to do so. When you show up somewhere that you haven't been before, and you walk in somewhere, what's the first thing you do? Look for someone to recognize. Look for someone you recognize. If you don't see someone you recognize, and it's something you have to do, let's say you are signing up for classes at school. Brand new school, you just moved here from Minnesota, you show up to Nevada, you show up to the high school, and you're supposed to go and sign up for classes. Friday at 2 o'clock. It's 2 o'clock Friday, you show up, people are walking, from all over, you've seen, you've been in this situation before, right? Or something similar. And people are walking in, and you see parents and kids and everyone walking, and you get there, and what is the first thing you do? You look around and you try to find somebody who knows what's going on. You don't know what's going on. Where do you go? Which table do you go to? Who do you talk to? Where, what, right? You don't know anything. And so the first thing you do is you start looking, and if you see a bunch of people walking over to this table or to a room, <laughs> you just stand right in behind him and walk in and you get in there and you're looking around and you're waiting for someone to say something and people are leaning over the table and you go and you lean over the table and pick up whatever they're picking up and okay, I'll do whatever they're doing, I guess. We naturally want to find somebody who acts like they know where they're, if they're walking definitively, you go, damn, I'm walking behind this person. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing, but he does. Right? Remember that in life. Be the person who knows where you're going. Because people will naturally fall behind you. It's natural. If you're the person who knows what's going on. And even if you're not, act like it. 
People will respect you. You'll get raises. Or you can ignore me and not get a raise. All right. Next one. Group think. Group think is very similar to peer pressure, but different. Group think is when you take a position based on the group you belong to. Group think is when you take a position or accept a claim because you believe you're complying or comporting with your group identity. It's when you take a position or accept a claim because you believe it fits in with your group identity. Is that like with sports? It could be. How so? I mean, I play softball, so I feel like if like my captain were to say like they're our rival, you would all say. Oh, that's interesting. They are our rival. Yeah, that's a great example. That's a great example. Group think. We hate the Titans. Why? Well, because we're the butterflies. <laughs> What a horrible team name, huh? <laughs> There's never been a team called the Butterflies in the history of any sport, right? The Butterflies, we flutter around. <laughs> and then light. I played soccer, though, and we were called the T-Birds. The T-Birds? I think that was corny. Super yeah. Corny. <laughs> I was like six, though, so. Yeah. I like that's You're going T-Birds? <laughs> Can we get a better name? The Destroyers, yeah. Yeah, group, group think your group identity controls your position. So that's a good example, a team. You hate the other team or you, they, they're your evil enemy because they're just in another team. You're, that's your group identity. I'm a Democrat, so I have to not like Republicans. That's group think. If you're a Democrat, how must you vote? You must vote for Democrats. Why? It's group think. If you're a member of the police department, you must think like a cop and have all the positions that all the cops hold, and on and on, whatever group it is. You see how it's similar to peer pressure, but groupthink is, is your identity in a group. It's a defined group. I'm a, member, I'm a Mormon, so I must think like a Mormon. I'm a Catholic, I must think like a Catholic. It's the identity of the group that controls you instead of your peers. Your peers are the people you surround yourself with. Your group is a defined group. Identity. So sometimes your peers are also your group, but not always. So when you're distinguishing between the two, remember if it's a defined group, then it's going to be groupthink. If it's not, and it's just your buddies you hang out with and your peers, your cohorts, your equals in this world, then that would be peer pressure. I'm sorry? If it's a defined group, then it's groupthink. If it's not a defined group, then it's peer pressure. It's just your, your cohorts, your pals, your equals. Another one that's very similar to this, peer pressure and groupthink, is called nationalism. The rhetorical device of nationalism. Nationalism is when you substitute pride in your country for reasoning. And it's the idea that whatever your country does is right. Whatever position your country takes is the right position. It substitutes pride in your country for reasoning. And it's the position that whatever my country does, whatever position they take, whatever actions they do, are right. I'm Mexican, so everything that Mexico does is right. I'm Norwegian, everything Norway does is the right thing. I'm American, everything America ever does is right. Pride in your country is, I think, a laudable thing to have because it provides, again, through through time, we've realized that if we can't count on the people that 
or our ours, us, then we're in big trouble. But at the same time, you got to be able to challenge if your country does something that you think is not right. Stand up. Use critical thinking. Use rational thinking. Be the voice of reason. If there's slavery, you stand up and say, we ought not have this. Even though all your peers may be saying, no, it's a perfectly fine thing to do. Or your party might be saying, we're the party of slavery. Or whatever else, right? I mean, there's a million examples of people that have done this through, through time. All right. Next one. Rationalization. A rhetorical device of rationalization. Rationalization. That's a six syllable word. So you can go home and be very multisyllabic this evening and wow your friends and family. Rationalization. Rationalization is when you use self deception to try to get somebody, or for you, you use self deception um, when you accept a, a claim instead of reasoning. A substitute self deception for reasoning. Let me give you an example of rationalization. There's one I, I like to I like to share because it reminds me of my favorite one of my favorite TV shows, The Simpsons. One of the first ep episodes, one of the first seasons of Simpsons was an episode where it's Marge's birthday, and Homer wants to get. Does everybody here know what Simpsons are? Familiar with it? Okay, I just I don't know. I don't know you guys. Sometimes you guys shock the hell out of me. <laughs> the longest running TV show of all time, or. Uh, Remember when it came out? Yes. Yeah? No, I wasn't alive. December, December 1989. Remember that? Negative 10. Anyway, there's an episode where it's Marge's birthday and Homer's going to buy her a gift, so he goes to the mall and there's a sporting goods store at the mall. And he's walking up and down the sporting goods aisles because. Clearly, she's going to want some sporting goods, I guess. And uh, he sees the bowling balls, and he goes, oh, bowling balls. Look at these beautiful bowling balls. And he's admiring them, and he says, you know what? Marge has always said she wants to start spending more time with me. And I do a lot of bowling. So if I got her a bowling ball, then I would make her happy because she could spend more time with me. And I'll bet you she would love this bowling ball. This is a beautiful 15-pounder. No response? No response at all. I just said a 15-pounder. Does anybody bowl? Do you bowl? Why didn't you respond? I said a 15-pounder, you, you just let it go. Who bowls with a 15-pound bowling ball? Does Marge? No. No. Little tiny, frail Marge? <laughs> no, she doesn't bowl with a 15 pounder. She'd go, <laughs> and that's exactly what she does in the show. A 15 pounder is a very heavy ball. Typically, large men bowl with 15 pounders. You don't have dainty little barges that bowl with 15 pounders. They bowl with the six pounders. So I said 15 pounds, and you guys just let it go. Shame on you. Yes. <laughs> yes, I know. You bowl with a 13. Damn! <laughs> good for you. Tears a good throw sometimes. Yeah. All right. It's not that Look at that. Bad. Okay. <laughs> That's why you didn't say anything. <laughs> That's why you didn't say anything. Because you're saying 15 pounder, a 17 pounder. Sometimes you go on a diet and get down there. So. <laughs> you always use a 10. See, my problem is I've got these. My thumb, for some reason, is this. I don't know, this weird knuckle. Oh, don't, don't, don't look at me now. It's, it's hideous. So whenever, whenever I, I, I am stuck by being able to get my thumb in the hole, 
you know, because I don't have my own, and so I'm always going dink, 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 Oop, there we go, and you know, holy crap, and this is for these monster men who the holes are this big around, you know, and I'm like, damn it, so I've always had to ball with those 15 pounders my whole life, because those are the only ones that ever fit my thumb. That's why you don't put your thumb in. Yeah. I could just do the hole. Yeah. yeah. I don't even do that. You just, you just grab it. <laughs> my first time we ever went bowling, my brother goes out there and grabs the bowling ball and teeters out there with little kids. He goes, ah, he goes dee, 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 dee. sure enough, <laughs> strike the very first time right between his legs. And he's always been that way. He's very good at sports. Where was I? Large. So he buys her a bowling ball. <laughs> and he says, well, she's not here, so I guess I'll just have to use my fingers to drill the holes. So he measures it out and drills big old fat Homer Simpson holes. And then he says, and since she does love her husband so much, I'm sure she's going to want Homer engraved on her ball. So he gets Homer engraved on it with the big fat holes d drilled in there, buys it, and then takes it home to her for her birthday and gives it to her for her birthday. What does she do? She goes, <laughs> when she opens it, says, what the hell is this? And he goes, oh, I thought you would want, I thought you would like that. And of course, she ends up saying, screw you, I'll bowl with this thing, and she drags it around, and she ends up, well, anyway, it's a fun little episode. She starts dating her bowling coach. <laughs> Payback. Did she really want the bowling ball? Who was lying there? Homer. And to whom was he lying? Himself. himself. You see that? He knew what was going on, but he was trying to lie to himself. The weirdest thing in the world is when we use rationalization because we know we're lying to ourselves, but we do it anyway. As if someone's listening. Rationalization is... is is an interesting little thing. Now, I'll give you another example. Let's say I uh, want to have my wife have a wonderful evening because I care about her so much. And I say, you know, honey, tonight I've decided that it's just all about you tonight. So this is your night where you will have all the wonderful things that you love so what I've done for you is I've, I've drawn a nice bath, a bubble bath. And it's soapy and it's sudsy and it's nice and warm. And I've lit some candles around there. And here's a stack of some novels that you like to read. You know, the romantic ones that are all smutty. Those are novels right there, you can read those. And I put on some, some old uh, 60s R&B. And uh, you can just sit in the bath and you relax, and it's just about you tonight. And you enjoy your music, you enjoy your bath, you enjoy your candles, you enjoy your smutty novels. It's all about you tonight. I'll see you in a few hours. I'm going to go to the strip club with the guys. <laughs> because it's about you tonight. And you don't want me in your hair. You don't want me around. I'm just annoying. So I'm going to get out of your hair because it's about you, and I'm going to go to the club with the guys. I'll see you later. Rationalization, right? A little bit of a guilt as well. I would never do that. <laughs> it was just an example. Not that I've ever done it. All right. Next one. Popularity. The rhetorical device of popularity. When we urge someone to accept a claim, simply on the grounds that all or most or a substantial number of people believe it. 
popularity is, the, is when you try to get someone to accept a claim, or you do accept a claim, because everyone believes that it's true. Popularity is that when you try to get someone to accept a claim, or you accept a claim, because everyone or most people believe it's true. Is there a God? Well, most people believe there's a God, so yeah, there probably is. That's popularity. Did Trump collude with the Russians? You get to watch the news about that? Two years of investigating the Trump administration. By the way, I, I, I gotta I gotta just put this in perspective. You guys know what happened with Nixon? President Nixon? Watergate. Watergate. Mm. What's Watergate? Of his recording because he was so paranoid. There was recordings? Yeah. Okay, so we know we know that there's Watergate, there's recordings. Yeah. What else do we know? They said he had people <coughs> going there and uh, going to where? Stage, uh, like a federal building containing those. Okay. Clouds. So there was a there was a robbery. Yeah. And they found out that he was in on it and his administration was up to it. Did they find out he was in on it? Um, I, I believe they did, because he resigned. Yeah, but they didn't find out he was in on it. He did resign, though. Yeah. Yeah. If you want, there's, there's, there's two stories to this, by the way. Um, Gordon Liddy wrote a book called Will, where he talks about what happened. And he says that Nixon wasn't in on it. That it was John Dean who was the one that, that did everything. And John Dean says, no, no, Nixon knew about all this stuff. So it's just interesting because we don't know for sure what he knew and what he didn't know. But, um, but he resigned as a president because during an election, he was, he was running for re-election. And by the way, he, he didn't have to do this because he was a very liked president, very popular president. <clears throat> but during the election, um, the opponent, the Democrats' uh, headquarters were in the Watergate Hotel. The Watergate Hotel had some office buildings there in the hotel. And the headquarters for the Democratic um, Party was there at the, at the Watergate. And so um, Liddy, Gordon Liddy, was in charge of this kind of surreptitious or shady activities um, of the re-election. And he talks in his book about all the stuff that they did. But one of the things that they did was they wiretapped the Democratic, the phones of the Democratic uh, offices to find out what's going on. And so they went in and they wiretapped the election, the Democrats' election office. And, uh, and so they had to break in to put the wiretaps in there. They broke in there and they wiretapped it and spied on the Democrats during the election time period. And then toward the end of the election, they broke in to the office again and they were going to switch the wiretaps from one phone to the other. And when they broke in, the second time, they took duct tape, and instead of putting the duct tape, if you're ever going to break in, this is a lesson to learn. <laughs> what they did was they, you know, when you, you open a door, you've got the little pushy outy thing. <laughs> the bolt lock. The bolt lock. <laughs> and 
that's what you know locks the door from opening. And so you open the door and that bolt lock goes in. And if you let the handle go, it goes back out again. So you take duct tape and you put it over that lock so that it just stays inside and then it goes back and forth, you could open it again. But if you put it long ways, like this, then you can't see it. If you put it short ways like this, then you've got duct tape on both sides. Someone walks by and goes, what the hell is duct tape doing on that door? So they broke in the first time they did it right. The second time they put the duct tape the other way, broke in so they could get out again, and a security officer goes by, sees it, goes in, catches them. And, um, and America thought that that was outrageous behavior that you would wiretap your, the other party during an election. And they uh, went after Nixon, and Nixon, uh, they found out that he was recording his meetings at the White House, and so they su subpoenaed his recordings to see what he knew and what he didn't, and that's when he, uh, you know, the issues of the recordings, and that's when he, he resigned. And we didn't know really what, what he did and didn't know, but... Um, so, I got a question for you. Did, was Trump accused of wiretapping Hillary Clinton? No, he was accused of colluding with the Russians, right? But here's what's weird about this whole thing. It's just so crazy to me. Did one of the side wiretap the other side? Yeah. Yeah. Obama wiretapped Trump's election campaign. Also put a spy in Trump's election campaign group. Wiretap the phones, put a spy in there. And Trump is the one that's being investigated. When there, I mean, there's no dispute that they did that. They admit it. They wiretapped Carter Page and put a spy in there. Isn't that crazy? I mean, do they go to jail for that? Well, no. You know who goes to jail? You, me, people who are not the elite political class. America is becoming what we hate with other countries. It's becoming a country where the elite are above the law. And it's frustrating. If the FBI ever came to me and said, well, I want to question you, I'd go, what? wait a second. When Hillary Clinton was questioned about her, in fact, remember when Hillary Clinton, about the, her server? Uh, email. The emails in the server? <laughs> Where's your emails? What did she do with her emails? Do you remember? She deleted. she deleted all her emails. They sent a subpoena. She deleted all of her emails and then took her phone and smashed it with a hammer, took her computer and bleached, did put a bleach drive on it and destroyed the hard drive of her computer and deleted everything and then said, after deleting it all, I don't have any emails. I deleted them all. Oops. Ah. And they, the government said, oh, well, she doesn't have them. If you got subpoenaed and you deleted the stuff, you would go to prison. I'm telling you right now, I couldn't defend you. You'd go to prison. If you smashed your, your cell phone with a hammer, you'd go to prison. This isn't, I mean, this isn't like, well, come on, you're being by. No, I mean, look it up. She did all these things. She didn't go to prison. Well, okay. But we don't know whether what the emails had on it, right? Oh, wait, no, that's not true. We found the emails. Remember? You guys don't even know about this, do you? <laughs> Remember Wiener? The Congressman Wiener? <laughs> you don't know who the Congressman Wiener, the Congressman from New York? 
He was married to Hillary Clinton's chief of staff. So Hillary CC'd her chief of staff in all of her emails. So those emails went to her chief, his, her chief of staff's computer, and it was uploaded onto Wiener's computer. Well, Wiener was busted for soliciting sex from a minor, and so they got his, his laptop, and guess what they found on his laptop? All of Hillary Clinton's emails that were sent to his wife, who was the chief of staff, after Hillary, under oath, said, they're all gone, nobody has them, and everyone was questioning, everyone said, we don't have them, we don't have them. They accidentally fell ass backwards and found all of their emails. And the FBI looked at all the emails, and guess what they found out? Did you guys watch the news brief when, when the head of the FBI spoke and they asked him what he found? She lied, she lied, she lied, she lied, she lied. She lied. She sent and received confidential information over and over again. She used her personal email for confidential information. She was, I mean, on, on all the stuff she said was a blatant lie. Blatant lie. Why did she go to prison? So we have somebody who's lying, proven, evidence is there. She doesn't go to prison. What's going on with our, with our country? It's crazy. And the Mueller report just came out, and Mueller says, after two years of talking to everybody and subpoenaing everybody, we found no evidence of collusion. Nobody's being indicted for colluding with the Russians. It's just interesting that there's so much, I mean, if you look for inequality, there's a lot of inequality going on. You know, what can you do about it? I don't know. It's frustrating, though. It would be nice, as a citizen, which I'm just one of, to have some consistency. I'd like to see bad guys go down for doing bad things. I don't want to see good people, I mean, I don't want to see, not bad, good people get off, but I don't want to see bad people that are not powerful get off, you know. It's like, it's like with this Smollett story. You know the Smollett story? No? Yeah. He's an actor from, what's the show? I don't watch it. Uh, Empire. The actor from Empire who faked his, his uh, racial assault. He hired, he hired two bodybuilders, two black dudes, to beat him up. And then he went to the media and to the police and said, two white guys in, in Trump hats attacked me and said, this is MAGA country, and beat me up, and called me racial names and poured bleach on me. And everyone flipped out and said, holy crap, that's a horrible crime. And it turns out it was a lie. He faked it all. But well, he still says it's the truth. All the charges got dropped. I know. That's crazy. All the charges got dropped. Why did all the charges get dropped? That's my point. Why did all the charges get dropped? <laughs> Look it up. Find out why the charges got dropped. The FBI is investigating it. Because Michelle Obama's, I think, chief of staff called the prosecutor, and after the phone call, the prosecutor dismissed all the charges against him. That's the allegation. But it just makes me go, why is there, why is there a level of criminal culpability for others and, and not for if you know the right people. I guarantee you if you did that, you, I couldn't defend you. You'd go to prison. You can't do that. But he walks free because you know the right people. And some people say, well, it's about time a black man gets off. And I think, no, you can't say that. You want, you want the other way around. You don't, want, you don't want guilty people to get off. No, you want... Guilty people that are getting off to be prosecuted. That's what you want. You want consistency, not in inequality applied. No, you want equality applied. So anyway, so who, who started me on this tangent? <laughs> you did with the Mueller report. No, that wasn't you. I asked about it. I asked about it. <laughs> He's like, damn it. All right. <laughs> Pop
Popularity. Next one. Next one is common practice. Common practice. You try to justify or defend an action or practice or accept a claim on the grounds that it is common. Everybody's doing it. You try to get someone to accept a claim because it's a common practice. Everyone is doing it. The idea that a claim is right because everybody does it. How is it different from the last one we just mentioned? The popularity. Popularity and common practice, what's the difference? You may not believe the truth. It's the belief. With common practice, it's what people do. With popularity, it's what people believe, it's what they think. What most people do versus what most people think. Is it okay to cheat on your taxes? Yeah, everybody does it. <laughs> See how that's common practice. What's the best way to get to the airport? We'll take, most people take the 15 freeway. Is that the best way? Well, most people do it. See how that's common practice. It's the fallacy of common practice. Just because most people do something doesn't make it the right thing to do. Just because most people believe something doesn't make it the right thing to believe. One is common practice, the other is popularity. Popularity is what people think and believe. Common practice is what people do. See the difference? Next one. Tradition. Tradition is the idea that something is right because this is the way it's always been done. Tradition holds that a claim is correct because things have always been done that way. It's our tradition. So you go, you're in a new relationship, you're either just moved in or just married or however it is where you're now committed to this person and you're going to share a life together and you decide it's Christmas time, you're going to go to Walmart and get some decorations to decorate your humble little abode. So you go to Walmart. And if you're the type that's going to decorate for Christmas, you decide we need some, we need a tree, we need something to go on top of the tree. And so after getting the ornaments, you say, let's find something to go on top of the tree. And your significant other says, that's a good idea. And you kind of spread out, break, separate out, grab a nice beautiful star that you find and start walking over and you find out your partner is walking over with a beautiful angel. And you go, what are you doing? Well, I've got an angel. No, I've got a star. No. An angel goes on top of the tree. Uh, I don't think so. A star goes on top of the tree. My family always had a star on top of the tree. We never had an angel on top of the tree. Well, my family would never be seen dead with people that had stars <laughs> on top of the tree. We were the angel on the top of the tree families. And your loving relationship that you never had an argument about is all of a sudden throwing down over whether you have a star or an angel on top of your tree. And it's based on what? Your tradition. Because damn it, the way your family did it is the right way to do it. And you can't think of it any other way. It's got to be done that way. And you find out in life that you, what some of the most horrific arguments you have are because of these stupid traditions. Because you just can't shed the fact that my family did it differently. And then after that drag out, somebody's, their compromise is you're going to paste a star on top of the angel's head. <laughs> and you get home after you almost break up. And you load all the stuff at the Christmas tree. And then you go, okay, great. Well, we got everything set up. It's Christmas Eve. Let's go to bed. 
and your significant other says, what do you mean go to bed? Well, yeah, let's go to bed. we got presents to open in the morning. In the morning? No. It's Christmas Eve. We open the presents Christmas Eve. No. Christmas morning. And then it all starts again. What, are you crazy? Christmas morning? You're one of those types? And then you argue about the Christmas morning versus the Christmas Eve, right? Has everybody had that argument before? No? But you've heard of it, right? How many people open presents Eve? How many people do it in the morning? All right, let's separate out. <laughs> the grips and the bloods. <laughs> The kids open it on Eve. The kids open it on Eve because they just can't wait. Damn. The little kids that don't want to see their grandparents yeah. in the morning. <laughs> That's interesting. All right. Tradition. Okay, next one. Let's talk about relativism. Relativism is the fallacy that your culture determines truth. Relativism is the fallacy that <laughs> truth, truth is relative and is based on your culture. Relativism is the belief that truth is relative, not absolute. It's relative and it's based on your culture. Given several examples in the class about this already. Truth is relative and it's based on your culture. <laughs> Having babies out of wedlock. Remember, I gave that as an example. Is that something that's right or wrong? Well, it's an interesting question. We talked about ethics in the class, what's right and wrong, and how we can tell. You either have the a priori of Kantian's categorical imperative, or you can have the example of Bentham and Mill doing what's the most good for the most number of people. But that's an example of something that some cultures say, perfectly fine. Some cultures say it's tolerated. Some cultures say it's encouraged. Other cultures say, absolutely not, that's wrong. Well, is one culture right or wrong? Or do you just say, you can have different cultures believe different things, and they're equally right. We'll agree to disagree. The fallacy is that. The fallacy is that you can say, we'll agree to disagree. You can't. Truth is not relative. When it comes to moral issues, if it's non-moral issues, fine. But if it's moral issues, truth is not relative. Truth is absolute. It doesn't matter what your culture says. Because once you start saying it's cultural, then all of a sudden you get onto the slippery slope, and the end of that slippery slope is, well, my culture says it's okay to stone women who are seen outside with people other than their husbands. Is that wrong to do? Who are we to say? That's what they do in their culture. Pick up a rock. If you're, if you're in their culture, might as well join in. When in Rome. And critical thinkers say, no, we don't do that. We can't do that. Truth isn't relative based on your culture. When it comes to moral issues. When it comes to other issues about whether you open Christmas presents on the day before or day after or whatever, that, that's, not a, that's not a moral issue. But with moral issues, truth isn't relative. So the fallacy is that truth is relative and it's based on your culture. Very similar to that relativism is the idea of subjectivism. Subjectivism. Subjectivism holds that truth on moral issues, truth is relative based on an individual's opinion. 
Truth is relative based on an individual's opinion. Relative. It's not absolute. It's not objective. It's subjective based on your opinion. When it comes to moral issues. And a critical thinker says, no, you can't have that. Truth is truth. Right and wrong is right and wrong. You can disagree with it all you want. You can think it's OK to steal somebody's laptop. But it's wrong. Society says this. We have our laws. And we say, you can't do this. Somebody gets arrested, and what do they try to do? Rationalize, explain, convince you why it was OK to do it. Why did you beat your girlfriend? Well, she was mouthing off. <laughs> Right? It was okay to do it. No, I'm sorry. It's wrong. Well, we'll agree to disagree. You can't arrest me because I disagree with you. I think it's okay to smash her in the face. No, no. What? Well, well, great. Can we do this? Can we just disagree? Yeah. You have a vote. I have a vote. I vote. It's okay. You vote. It's not okay. You can't arrest me. Is that what we do? No. We say, I'm sorry. You can disagree all you want. You're still going to jail. Because Moral issues, there's a right and a wrong. There's truth. There's absolute truth on these things. And it's not based on your opinion when it comes to morality. So you can think it's okay to molest kids. It's not. Well, we'll agree to disagree. No, we won't. We're going to jail. You guys see what I mean? Got it? All right. So relativism is cultural-based. Subjectivism is individual-based. Next one, the fallacy that two wrongs make a right. The fallacy that two wrongs make a right. Two wrongs make a right? Yeah. wrongs equal a right. Kids say this all the time. You're at somebody's house, you're talking, kids are in the other room, all of a sudden you're, ah! <laughs> ah! You walk in there and the little kid's on the ground, crying. The other kid's standing over him. <laughs> We've all seen it, right? Anybody say, what happened? And the kid on the ground says, he pushed me. He started it. And the other one says, he pushed me first. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, OK then. Perfectly fine. Shove away. <laughs> if he pushed you first, then that's perfectly fine. Two wrongs make a right. Parents in, ingrain that in kids by saying, why did you push him first? As if it's OK to push him back. No, no, come in and towel. Don't push him back. It's not okay, two wrongs don't make a right. The Crips and the Bloods have been shooting each other for 50 years. The Hatfields and the McCoys have been shooting each other for a couple hundred years. Why? They don't remember. All they know is they did something bad to me, and so I'm doing something bad to them. And then it just goes, perpetuates on and on and on, and then it's okay. I was watching a... Uh, a documentary. There was a filmmaker over in, I think it was Kuwait. And there was these little kids, little Kuwaitis. And the filmmaker was talking to him and he said, oh, did you hear about in America the planes that hit the trade centers? And the kids knew about it. They said, yeah, 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 we know about that. He said, what do you think? And they said, they deserve it. Americans deserve that. And the guy said, well, why? Why do you think that? And the kid said, because the Americans have been meddling in our lives for years. Oh, well then okay. That's a mindset of a very unsophisticated person or culture. Unsophisticated cultures and people think like this. It's okay to harm somebody because I was harmed. 
No, civilized, rational people don't act that way. We address things on the merits, not on brute force. Two wrongs don't make a right. You don't steal something because someone stole from you. You don't punch someone because someone punched you. Because it never, ever, ever ends. And this is one of the problems I had. I remember when Bush, President Bush, <clears throat> after 9-11, went out there and started acting like a gung-ho, two wrongs make a right sort of guy. And I was saying, no, you can't do that. I understand it's natural. We want to do that. But you can't. You act, if you need to do something militarily, fine. But you don't do it because it's retribution. You can't do that. That's not the way civilized societies run things. And it's the same thing with the death penalty. Why do we do the death penalty? If it's because two wrongs make a right, that's not the reason to do it. It's not about retribution. There's other arguments for the death penalty, but that's a bad one. And again, President Bush argued, well, it's deterrent, and because two wrongs make a right. I was like, oh, dude. I didn't like a lot of the stuff he said. It wasn't that bad of a president. He just wasn't very articulate at sharing his thoughts, or he didn't have very articulate thoughts, one of the two. I don't know. But, but overall, I, the country was not too bad during, the, during those years, I guess. All right, next one. Red herring, smoke screen. Let's talk about red herring and smoke screen. These are the last two. First one is red herring. Red herring, like the fish, H-E-R-R-I-N-G. Red herring is a fish. Anybody ever had a red herring? They stink. They're stinky fish. Smoke screen is the other one. We'll talk about that one in just a minute. So red herring and a smoke screen, the last two. They're similar, but different. A red herring is a fallacy where you divert the attention and the topic while hiding the diversion. You divert the attention or the, you divert the topic while hiding the diversion. And you bring up a new topic. You divert the topic, hide the fact, and then bring in a new one. It's like what magicians do. We have something over here. And then all of a sudden, boom, and then now we got something over here, you're like, oh, what happened? Uh, that's the same idea. But we do it with topics. And so with the red herring, give you an example. Somebody says, you know, it's tragic that we have 1.5 million unborn children being murdered every year. Something needs to be done about this tragedy. And they're in a debate with somebody. And then the other person says, you know, it's tragic. What's tragic is that millions of children are dying in Africa every year from starvation. That's what we need to be focusing on, is what we can do about starving children. If that's your goal, then we should really work at bridging relationships with other countries. Do you see how the red herring work. Politicians love this because they can avoid their weak spots and focus on their strength. You see how we went from abortion to starving children and international relations by just using buzzwords, tragedy, children, and then all of a sudden now we're over here on international relations in Africa by just switching over, using the buzzwords, and now all of a sudden the person's going, well, no, wait, no, I don't think we should be doing that with Africa, and then all of a sudden now we're talking about Africa, and we avoided the difficult topic of abortion that the person didn't want to talk about because it was a weak spot. 
Watch politicians, they do this all the time. Somebody will ask Hillary Clinton about her emails. And she'll say, you know, if you're, if, you're, if you're concerned about safety, if you're concerned about safety, then you need to be focusing on the fact that we don't have safe schools. And we don't have, and all of a sudden, we're diverting from safety to schools and because it's the strength of hers, right? Politicians do this all the time. Whatever the topic is, they'll divert and move to their strength by using a buzzword. So here's how I remember it. A red herring is a stinky fish. So we're on the topic of whatever the topic is. So let's say you've escaped from prison and the bloodhounds are after you and you've got a red herring in your pocket and the bloodhounds are on topic. They're zeroed in on your scent. They know who you are and they're coming after you and you're running from the bloodhounds. They're going, burr, and you're running. Burr. And you go, I'm screwed. They're on top of me. They got my scent. They, they're on topic. And you go, just a second, my red herring. And you rub it across the ground, and you throw it in the bushes, and you take off running. And the dogs come up, burr, burr, and they hit the red herring, and they turn and they fall into the bush. That's how the red herring works. The dogs think they're on the same trail, but they're not. They're now off on something else. You've diverted, you're free and safe, and they're now focusing on something else. Hopefully now, you will think about those stupid dogs and the person that escaped from prison every time you hear a red herring, and you remember how it works, right? I hope. Okay, next one is smoke screen. Smoke screen is different from the red herring, but they're close relatives. The book says, red herrings distract by pulling one's attention away from the topic toward another topic. Smoke screens tend to pile issues on or make them extremely complicated until the original issue is lost in a smoke. Do you want to write the whole thing down, or do you just want to hear it again? It says, smoke screens pile issues on to make them extremely complicated until the original issue is lost in a verbal smoke. So it's when you pile on a whole bunch of facts, statistics, and complications to obfuscate the original issue. You want to hide it. Not divert, you want to hide it. Get lost. Again, politicians love to do this one as well. You say, so let's say somebody does the red herring. You know, one and a half million unborn children are dying every year. Another politician. You know, it's tragical. My daughter always says the word tragical, so I think it's a cute word. <laughs> when she was a kid. That's tragical. Anyway. You know, it's a tragedy, is that children in Africa are dying, one and a half million children in Africa are dying every year from starvation. Red herring, right? So then the other person says, oh, damn it, I'm going to use a smoke screen then. Well, actually, if you want to solve the African problem, you got to realize that about 80% of all the food in America is not consumed. And of that 80%, we actually export about 40% of our exports, and that 40%, about 12% goes to Africa. And of that 12%, only about 90% is actually reaches the, the ports. And of that 90%, only about 2% actually reach the, reach the people. And of that 2%, only about a half percent of that is actually consumable. And so if you're talking about whether or not we should do something in Africa, the statistics just don't bear, bear it. What have I done? Smoke screen. It never goes, oh, okay. That was good. Good answer. Good answer. Did anybody follow it? No. No, it doesn't matter. But you know you don't want to sound stupid, so you go, oh, well, anyway, okay, yeah, whatever. And then you just gotta move on and you've now done a smoke screen. You guys know what smoke screens are. Remember Batman and Robin? You know, 
driving his Batmobile and he hits a button and the smoke comes out and the person behind him can't, doesn't know where he's at and mm -hmm. crashes, that's a smoke screen. You get lost. You get, you get confused from the smoke. So that's how smoke screens work. Questions. Lots of fallacies and rhetorical devices we talked about today, huh? All right. No questions about any of them? Are we done? Are you guys done? Just took a fork in you? It's been a long day, huh? Yeah, and there's not a lot of exciting stuff in here. I try to make it exciting, but there's just not a lot of exciting stuff in here. Next time I'll bring bowling balls. <laughs> and juggling for you. I, I see a probably good juggling. Right? I juggle. Alright guys, have a good week.